This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Get an entire yearly subscription for only $11.99 right now with their special holiday deal at curiositystream.com slash HAI. World War II. Of all the world wars, it's definitely in the top three. While World War II had a lot of fighting, there was very little seen in North America apart from one Pearl Harbor sized exception. In fact, the lack of a German invasion in North America is one of the first facts I learned about World War II in school, along other basics. Nazis bad, America good, Russia good but then later bad, Churchill drunk but still good, etc etc. So you can imagine my surprise at discovering, when I delved into the topic minds for a fresh new clickbaity title, that in fact, the Germans did invade North North America once in 1943 for 28 hours in a mission that was then forgotten about for over 30 years. It was all centered around weather. You know, the app on your phone that says whether you should wear a jacket today. Back in World War II, cell service wasn't good enough for smartphone based applications, so if you wanted to know what the weather was going to be, you needed to have your own weather predicting apparatus. And that was where the Germans had a problem. You see, weather systems in the northern hemisphere generally move from west to east, for a lot of complicated reasons that I don't have time to get into. Something, something Coriolis effect. I don't understand the link between Toyota's best selling line of subcompact and compact cars and weather patterns either, but that's what Google's for. The point is, if you want to know what the weather will be like in the Atlantic Ocean and Europe in a few days, you have to know what's happening in North America now. It's like how if you want to know what memes will be trending on Instagram tomorrow, you should look at Reddit today. The Allies, because they controlled North America and most of the land around it, had plenty of weather stations in North America, Iceland, and Greenland, which meant they could predict what the weather would be like in Europe before the Germans could. In the early stages of the war, the Germans got North American weather reports from seeker Arctic stations, weather ships, weather aircraft, and U-boats with weather instrumentation, but at this stage, their North American weather stations were easily captured by the Allies because, you know, they were on Allied land and weather stations can't run very fast. The ships were also captured, and the aircraft were very limited in what they could collect because every time they flew into the West Atlantic they risked being shot down. Also, in order for the U-boats to transmit weather data, they would have to break radio silence, thus allowing them to be tracked, which really undermined the whole not getting found part of being a U-boat. But the Nazis really needed accurate weather data because accurate weather prediction is a super important step in creating a pan-German racial state. Tides affect where ships can land, storms affect where ships and aircraft can safely travel, fog, rain, and clouds affect visibility, temperature affects what equipment and clothing troops need, and so on. In fact, D-Day was largely contingent on it being a day with low tide, minimal cloud cover, light winds, and low seas, which would allow the Allied troops to see, avoid, and disarm the sea mines off the coast of Normandy. So the Germans designed a secret weather station called the Ritter von Grittland. While secret Nazi weather station sounds like the plot of a direct-to-video History Channel movie, this was actually totally real. These secret Nazi weather stations were then deployed in several key locations. 14 were put in Arctic and subarctic areas, 5 were placed around the Barents Sea, and 2 were intended for North America. However, only one of those two made it, as the submarine carrying the other was sunk by a British air attack. Which, you know, good. It was a Nazi submarine and sinking Nazi submarines is what you're supposed to do. The other station traveled in a U-boat, the U-537, which left for North America from Kiel, Germany. In order to keep it secret, the station was nicknamed Kurt, which is kind of a weird choice. Codenames are usually something much cooler. Like, imagine instead of being called the Manhattan Project, it was just called Steve. It doesn't have the same ring to it. Anyways, the U-boat, carrying Kurt, was badly damaged on its journey by a storm. After all, they didn't know the weather yet, but despite a crack in its hull and the loss of its anti-aircraft cannons, the U-537 made land on October 22, 1943 at Martin Bay in northern Labrador. And while some of the crew stayed back to repair the sub, the rest got to work installing Kurt. Once they were done, they camouflaged it with empty American cigarette packages, and because labeling it Secret Nazi Weather Station would have raised some eyebrows, they labeled it as part of the Canadian Meteor Service, which doesn't exist. Then, 28 hours after arriving, they left. While the station was expected to work for six months, for unknown reasons it stopped transmitting after one. Which again, you know, is good. Nazis are bad. Perhaps the strangest element of this story, though, is the entire thing was forgotten for over 30 years. Until 1977, Weather Station Kurt just sat there, unnoticed, until a geomorphologist, basically a landscape scientist, named Peter Johnson found it while working on an unrelated project. 
Because it was labeled as part of the Canadian Meteor Service, he didn't think much of it. But later, a retired engineer for the German engineering firm Siemens, who had originally built the station, found Johnson's notes, connected the dots, and got in touch with the Canadians, who pulled an Indiana Jones and decided that it belongs in a museum. Specifically, the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, where it still sits today. To this day, this remains as one of the only times where Nazi soldiers made landfall in North America. If you don't have time to go all the way to Ottawa to see Kurt, I've got a great way that you can still learn a ton about World War II. Curiosity Stream. It's a documentary streaming site with thousands of top quality films including literally dozens on World War II, and right now, during their special holiday sale, you can get access for an entire year for only $11.99. I just want to let that sink in. An entire year of access for $11.99. That's less than the cost of a chicken parm in Olive Garden, except instead of having an upset stomach, you get a year of access to incredible documentary films, plus that'll also include access to Nebula, the streaming site started by myself and a bunch of other creators that has loads of great original content. On Nebula, you'll even find the documentary that I filmed on the tiny remote South Atlantic island of St. Helena. You can sign up for CuriosityStream with this special pricing and get access to Nebula included at curiositystream.com/hai.